Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Wheeler and I'm the executive director for the Center for Digital Strategies here at Tuck, um, along with uh, Professor Alva Taylor, our faculty director, Joe McDonald, our assistant director and our colleagues uh, from Tuck Alumni Engagement. We're really excited today to welcome Larry Weber to uh, another in our series of webinars this spring open to both students and alumni. Um, today's topic focusing on China and its kind of technology and innovation impact and, and the kind of current global uh, situation regarding China is incredibly well timed. We couldn't have planned that any better, I don't think, Larry, if we if we wanted to. Um, but it's been a year since the initial restrictions were placed on Huawei um, regarding kind of importation of in usage of U.S. parts and, and services uh, at the company in support of its 5G network development and other other capabilities. Um, Larry is an advisor to a number of these companies, including Huawei, and we're excited to have him here to present a little bit about the evolution of, of China's relationship um, with the US and as, as an emerging technology power. Um, the center has paid a lot of attention over the last several years to China. Each of the last two academic years, we've traveled with students to China to meet with technology leaders. And one thing's for sure, it's an incredibly fast moving, evolving, changing space. Um, and we've been you know, from first from the first trip to this to the most recent trip in last fall, even in one year, the difference that a year makes in the evolution of China as a technology growth engine is significant. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Larry to introduce himself and talk a little bit about uh, our our session and the content today. Larry, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. I wanted to give some context um, to what I'm going to be presenting today and then Obviously, we'll open up to questions, but as Patrick said, it's very timely because uh, not only is uh, the Chinese government reworking, uh, you know, its power play on Hong Kong as of today, um, but also the U.S. government is even trying to restrict Huawei even more, along with ZTE, another very successful Chinese company. So, and why is a marketing guy talking about this? You might be asking. Well. Uh, a number of reasons. One is I go back 40 years in technology and innovation, and I'm going to give you some context on that as it relates to China and the United States. Because as of 40 years ago, it really was the UK, uh, Germany a little bit, and China, I mean, and the US that were the leaders in innovation and technology. Uh, and right now, and by the way, it was 40 years ago that I started introducing American technology products to the Chinese market. So that's the kind of experience that I've learned uh, really by doing the, what the innovation and technology strategy has been uh, in China and what it is really in the U.S. today as well, as both Germany and the U.K. have sold a lot of their assets. Um, Again, for context, we are in the seventh wave of computing. So put that in your minds. And that today is what is humanity meets computing. And that's what we're living in today and what you're seeing. And you're also seeing because of this virus an acceleration of digital technologies that we hadn't seen before. So we're going to be highly digitized and highly uh, using highly sophisticated innovations, but in an easy and simpler way. The eras of computing started around World War II, really, when you had the mainframe and then went into the uh, PDP-11s that made digital equipment so famous, the sort of mini computer era. Then the third era was the PC, which is the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, you know, up to that time, the Chinese had decided to focus on um, manufacturing. And I'll, we'll cover that as much as well. How do they get, and that's why, everything you're wearing right now probably has a tag that says made in China, all right? And that extended to technology, all right? So, and that was 40 years ago and we were introducing IBM PCs there, we were introducing Apples there, mostly to uh, classrooms and also software. You had Microsoft, you had uh, Lotus back then, uh, and you also had um, infrastructure technologies like Cisco. What the Chinese did back then was they really re-engineered those kinds of products so that they could build their own. And obviously there was some IP stealing even back then, like there has been 
sense in certain situations. So we can also talk about that in the question uh, and answer era. But it was about 20 years ago uh, that I think um, the Chinese started getting far more aggressive about um, being less of a manufacturer and more of a holistic approach to innovation and technology with the purchase of Lenovo, which was the IBM uh, PC division, and it became a, a Chinese company. Then about 15 to 17 years after we had really gone through the dot-com bust, you know, uh, the Chinese decided that they had to have their own internet kings uh, and and queens, <laughs> sorry. And uh, that's when you started to see the, the roots of things like Tencent and Weibo um, and Huawei starting to take off, um, Baidu, uh, you know, uh, and also things like Alibaba. You had the seeds all there and that was starting to move in. And of course the government was deep in investment and I'll get to that in a second as well. And it was 10 years ago that really China started to introduce products into the United States and to the West. So more inexpensive phones, you know, uh, China Tele Mobile had some mobile software, mobile networks, and that was starting to be China out as a strategy. A couple things I'd also like you to remember as context is the importance of Taiwan as a semiconductor ma maker, which adds to this whole government, you know, and technology marriage that is going to be very interesting to watch the next couple of years for sure. Uh, they should make a TV drama out of it, I think. And then uh, uh, the other part is software development. One area where the United States still is king is software. And that's an area from operating systems to applications to you name it. And uh, that's an area that we can, we're very strong in. But that being said, we have a time right now that um, the government isn't investing as much in innovation and technology. More, one last thing about my background, which I think a lot of you might find interesting, is that when we would help a startup launch their products or their company, they usually were very well funded. This is back in the 80s and 90s by the, really the banner list of venture capitalists. On the East Coast at that time, it was Charles River Ventures and Greylock. On the West Coast, you had Kleiner Perkins, you had Mayfield Partners, um, and you had um, Sequoia with uh, Mike Moritz. So um, I think that um, at that time, when they would give, let's say, example, $10 million to a startup uh, to uh, attack a market of technology, uh, guess who else was in the room all, almost all the time was a representative of the Department of Defense. Uh, or another government uh, agency, and they would write a check for five million bucks or more to also have a piece of this innovation and technology so that they could license it if necessary to be used in their government applications. So about 10 years ago, I noticed that there was less and less investment coming all right, from our government in a lot of the innovations and technology. So just put that aside, I'm not going to judge or be political about any of this, I'm just going to present what I think the facts are, and then we can talk about it uh, in the quick Q and A um, portion of, of this. Um, so I did a very creative title today for you all: China Technology and Innovation. Uh, I have learned not to try to be cute with my titles, um, so th that's what we're talking about. And the next slide, please. As I was saying, if you look at your iPhone, which was introduced in 2007, by the way, I can't believe it's already been 13 years since uh, Steve Jobs was on the, walking across the stage in Palo Alto and saying, do you get it? It's three things in one. And uh, if you can see the fine print here, it says designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. Next slide. So the model had been grow the ingredients. And let me just get, I have in my notebook, I'm working on a seventh book called The Angels in Our Machines. And I, it's about a lot of the early innovations and in technologies in the third wave of computing that we're still perfecting today. And that's what I mean by grow the ingredients. We developed everything to do with the screen technologies. We've had touch screen, 
uh, voice recognition. We've had, um, oh my gosh, we've had all the application software, security software, uh, different chip design, especially in the PC era with Intel and Qualcomm. We have video uh, uh, in innovations and um, inventions, uh, the refinement of communications technologies, and it goes on and on the list. But what happened was, while we were developing all this innovation, the Chinese were developing state-of-the-art manufacturing to put all those ingredients together in a, a way that could offer a, a far more inexpensive and value-oriented technology product, as well as starting then their own companies to do that. So grow the ingredients, they were cooking the meal is what I say. Next slide, George. Today, China is much more than a manufacturing powerhouse. If you haven't studied any of these companies, I recommend you do. I think you should look at Tencent and its leader, Pony Ma. He could be at home in Palo Alto as he is in Beijing. So, uh, and I think Tencent's done an amazing job with the combining and integrating of social. Uh, instead of like the US is set up with Facebook separate from LinkedIn, separate from Google, you know, Tencent has been able to integrate a lot of the next generation of social. Obviously, Alibaba, Jack Ma, and, uh, and his brilliance of, of really pushing e-commerce uh, to the limits and, uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the Pepsi to Alibaba's Coke, which is JD.com, and, um, and Oppo, which is really doing very well in the inexpensive uh, uh, smartphone ar arena. China Mobile, who's been around in telecommunication software, ZTE, and manufacturers like Huawei, Baidu, obviously the Google of China, and Huawei, who, if you don't know, besides all the controversy, around Huawei, the, uh, it is larger than IBM, Huawei, and is probably the largest uh, integrator of telecommunications and connectivity devices uh, and technology in the world. And we can talk a little bit more about them in a moment, but they have their own innovation powerhouse. I know this is a bit of an eye chart, uh, but I think China is laser focused on innovation. Uh, the spending increased 35% almost over 2017, nearly three times the overall growth rate among 1,000 global innovative companies that are listed by PricewaterhouseCoopers. In 2017, 125 Chinese companies were among the top 1,000 largest global public companies in R&D spending. In 2018, 145 Chinese companies made the list spending a combined $60 billion on research and development. And in the categories, I might add, that are going to be the future infrastructures, the communications infrastructures. We'll probably only have smartphones for the next five to seven years. Then who knows what it's going to be? Is it going to be in our glasses? Is it going to be in some kind of headpiece? Or is it even going to be part of our biology? Um, so, the spending right now is critical to do this. Next slide. So here's a very simpler slide and could show you the impact. We still lead the world in R&D, all right? Most recently, we spent 476 billion, China 372 billion, Japan is third, Germany fourth, Korea fifth, Fran and Samsung leads that at almost uh, 80%, and you know, France, India, UK, Brazil, and Russia. In, in the US, obviously, uh, Alphabet, Google's parent, Apple, Microsoft has come back. I, hats off to Satya. Uh, what a great CEO he has been. Uh, I would also put Facebook in there and um, as a powerhouse. And obviously, Amazon should be in there, who has become a powerhouse in probably seven different categories of technology, from drone to uh, e-commerce, to cloud, and it's huge. I'd also like to point out to those, especially business school uh, people, uh, students that are watching, that the, it's not just the, what I call the digital native companies. So Alphabet, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, 
Microsoft was pre-digital native, uh, you know, so they go back a little ways. But I also like to tell you that R&D is growing in the U.S. in what I call vertical markets. So the idea of Amazon uh, in things like delivery, uh, John Deere in precision agriculture, uh, Tesla in automotive. So this is something also the Chinese are taking note of is how we're quickly ver verticalizing our R&D and how critical that's going to be for the future. Additional R&D leaders I just have down there, I mentioned Samsung, they put their um, you know, R&D center and innovation center right in Palo Alto on uh, Sand Hill Drive where all the venture capitalists are and they are innovating. I think they're the largest chip uh, maker now in the world, especially in video chips. And then Volkswagen, who's is doing a lot of software in the car, much like Elon Musk has, uh, is trying to innovate for the next generation of transportation. So you see right in front of you the, the top 10. We like looking at 10, and we still have a lead, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. But you can see what money is buying right now. Next slide. Our future depends on what I'm trying to call open innovation. Um, if you haven't followed the news, as you know, IBM, one of our greatest innovators and technology companies for over 100 years now, uh, is betting their future on the purchase of Red Hat software, which was the original leader and developer of Linux software or open source. And the key is creating an open source based cloud that is going to be built on the shoulders of multiple innovations. Now you might say that goes against the idea of being secure. No, it doesn't. They can still build very secure with an open, um, open system. And I think that IBM's on the right track to do what the future needs. And I think we need to embrace that as a country and a world to go to more open innovation and look to things like Bell Laboratories, which in the United States many years ago is where most of the cellular wireless and telecommunications foundations were developed and invented. The transistor, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, you can look, but one of my favorite things to have as a kid was my transistor radio with one earpiece and then I could listen from Cleveland, Ohio across the lake to CKLW, the Motown station, it was just wonderful. Um, I also remember places like the MIT Media Lab, which launched in 1985, with the idea, Nicholas's idea, uh, Negroponte, that creative users and inventors would be in the same place. It has contributed significantly to the development of technology, health sciences, and now what I think is going to be critical too is the cheapness of connectivity that they're still working on, that I believe connectivity is a human right and should be able to be accessed by all for nothing, maybe pay for the speed, maybe pay for more security, but at least access, yes. And then also the idea of humanity and technology or biology and technology moving the forefront of what will be the eighth wave of computing. And basic science I, has always been free, at least to my knowledge, because that is how we grow, invent, advance and develop. And uh, it's really what the Japanese and Sony, the brilliant innovator in the 1980s, called pre-competitive research. So it was the science of, and research that was done before you started developing the products to be put into then a capitalistic and competitive mode. So next slide. Open innovation can happen in many forms. Shared research, I mean the web, Tim Berners-Lee that I worked with, when he moved his shared research from the CERN laboratory in Switzerland to the Lab for Computer Science at MIT and launched the World Wide Web and the World Wide Web Consortium, that was a shared research project around connectivity on top of the internet or the ARPANET. So that created the web that we have developed over the last 25, 27 years. An open cloud is going to be extremely important to be able to access knowledge, information, shared research, academic partnerships. We can't all go into our rabbit hole. We've got to stay open and understand the great engineering universities of China, the great engineering universities of India, 
uh, of Africa, Stellenbosch University, to understand what they're doing and create partnerships with them is going to be key to the collaborative standards bodies who are really looking at this research and seeing how it's going to be applied in the best human ways and for the betterment of human life. Uh, partnerships between industry leaders, I think you're gonna see more of that in the next years, especially in the United States. I think you're going to see um, Apple and Facebook and getting a little less, believe it or not, proprietary. I know we can argue about that in the Q&A, but I think it's gonna be, become an imperative that everybody can't just have their own platform that shares no knowledge, that doesn't help with advancing science for the benefit of humankind. I think there's going to be joint R&D investments. Uh, from I think governments will get back in, but I do think it's gonna be major companies that have to understand what is my technology and innovation strategy? What am I gonna buy? What am I gonna make? What am I gonna partner with? It's gonna be critical that every business executive understand the availability, the palette of technology and innovation available to them to create new and better products and services. And it goes much more and much more. Um, George. Obviously, I have a deep respect for not just these companies, but a multitude of companies and startups. But I do believe that we're in a refinement phase of computing, that we're not gonna see a lot of radical new computing, all right? But we're going to see the refinement of technologies like 5G, all right? One of the issues around 5G, before I talk a little bit more about these companies, uh, and why the United States government was upset with Huawei, was that they were 18 months ahead in the development of 5G. That was their innovation and R&D expense. My question to the Wall Street Journal was, why haven't you asked that question? Why was the United States 18 months behind in 5G technology? As of yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, AT&T announced that it was taking the 5G banner off some of its products because it wasn't truly 5G. That's just unprecedented to me. So that's an, a point we can also talk about a little more in the Q&A if you'd like. IBM, as I said, I'm bullish on IBM and Microsoft two of the older names in, uh, in technology in the United States. I think AT&T has a real shot, but it's, they're trying to become a content company as well. And I think it's gonna be hard to compete against Disney. So they might wanna stay as focused as they can on the connectivity. I think GE has a chance to come back. I think Tesla has a real chance to be, have an impact, um, especially uh, in, in a sustainable way. Salesforce in an applied software way, I think has a huge powerhouse. It does have competitors coming up like Pega, but it, 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 it's a powerful company run by a powerful CEO. Uh, Google is spending more and more of its money in R&D to help with complicated situations, especially uh, the analytics around health and, and health and distance. And even in this pandemic, they're trying to help uh, as is Apple and who has, I think, again, a bright future if they figure out Apple to have at least a, a, a value proposition in some of their products. Because as of now, the expense of an iPhone, it, it's almost become a fashion item. So it's like you're paying for a Gucci bag or something. So I think we have to watch that. Facebook, I think, has a real dilemma in its data issues and the way it uses its data and the privacy and the truth of editorial and of, uh, the truth of advertising. They're trying to address it, but I think they're getting a bit behind the eight ball. I hope they can get around it. It's a smart company. And then verticals like John Deere, who, how are we gonna feed 2 billion more people uh, by the year 2050? It's gonna to have to be through the use of software and smart technologies, not just smart tractors. So I like where we are. We have brilliant innovators. There's more coming, but I think, believe it or not, you're going to see less startups in the tech area because they're going to get bought quickly by these companies as the speed and acceleration of innovation just gets dizzying uh, uh, at this time in our history. George? China is moving toward a new goal. They have a whole program, uh, the 2025 strategic plan. 
It was launched five years ago. The objective was to transition being the world's factory or the largest manufacturer to a producer of high value products and services and achieve independence from foreign suppliers. And, you know, again, I'm not gonna get political about it. That's what their stated goal was. That's what they're trying to do and that's where they're putting their money. The plan focuses on high tech industries like pharmaceuticals, automotive, aerospace, semis, IT, robotics, et cetera, all areas that we lead in right now. All right, so we've got to pay attention, invest properly and creatively innovate. Next slide. You know, if we try to close off China, in my opinion, they'll innovate without us. Uh, they've been around a lot longer than the United States. Granted, we might not like the kind of government they have, uh, but you have to respect what they're doing from an innovation and a technology investment point of view, and they're right behind us. So how do we get them to partner with us? How do we get them to work with us more closely? How do, we get, how do they get us to trust them more, I think is an important thing as well. Next. That's sort of my at least setup of a presentation. I hope that made sense to you all. Again, I am not a deep China expert, but I think, I hope I illustrated that I know enough about what's going on that we can have a half hour here now of sort of a thoughtful discussion and questions from you all about your views, uh, as well as if we can answer your questions. Patrick? Larry, thanks for that kind of overview and, and background. I think it's all very important to kind of set the stage for a lot of folks. Um, for the, those in the, you know, on the line, I want to make sure to remind you that you can answer, you can ask your questions using the Q&A pod. It'll, if you hit the Q&A icon at the bottom, it'll open up. If you wouldn't mind just sharing your uh, tuck year, if, if you're a student or an alum, that would be really helpful for us as well. Um, so, and, and I'm also going to be joined here by Professor Alva Taylor, our faculty director, and we'll share some of the Q&A with you as we go along, as well as some from the audience. And, Kicking it off, we have a, a, a good level set question as well from a, an, an attendee about what's the difference between US innovation and China, Chinese innovation, uh, when you think about kind of the different form factors that takes and the different cultural kind of elements as well. Um, what's, what's been your experience? I think um, my experience and my observation comes, and I sort of steal this from a famous professor that started the lab of computer science at MIT, a dear friend who passed away right about the dot-com bust, as a matter of fact. And um, his name was Michael Vichuzos. He wrote a great book called What Will Be, which is still very relevant. Um, he said the biggest advantage the United States has right now, I mentioned it earlier, is software. Uh, software is a, not just an engineering thing, but it's a creative thing. And it goes deep into our culture, that creativity and that innovation, even from a developer point of view. And software is everything. If, if you don't have the best software, you can't have the best hardware. So again, how the Chinese are going to be able to develop the best software, they've been buying it mostly now, all right, to help them create the best manufacturing in the world. But how are they going to beat us at innovation without, without being the best at software development. So I think that's really key that. I also think our government needs to pay more attention to our innovation uh, as the Chinese government does to theirs and looks at it strategically. And then lastly, I would say education wise, I still think we raise the greatest engineers in the world. I think from, and it's not just MIT and Caltech and Stanford, it's, you know, come places like Purdue, like Thayer at, uh, at Dartmouth, uh, you know, there are great, great school engineering schools, Lehigh. Uh, so um, I think we have to have more partnerships, more co conversation together, like we used to have. So that would be some of my answer yeah. there. It's, it's been interesting as we've traveled to, to China the last few years as well, just the, the impact of, of kind of fundamentals around, around scale, right, and the ability to try things at scale much more easily and much more rapidly in China, I think has an acceleration piece to it that, that really can, is hard to, 
hard to truly understand until you operate in China and go to China and, and think about it. And, and it's something well, that we, we, you know, have historically had a significant advantage over a lot of other company countries in that event, but certainly not over China. Well, but remember our, our way of doing innovation to your question or to the person's question mm -hmm. is to historically innovate and create something and then put it out there. Yeah. And if it scales, it scales. If it doesn't scale, it doesn't scale. So the Chinese though have an immediate scale right in front of them with how many billion people do they have, you know? So they have an immediate scaling audience that if something catches on, it's gonna go fast, much like Tencent's technology and Huawei's technology. So, and um, you know who thinks about this a lot and wrote a book that I don't think a lot of people read was Reid Hoffman, the brilliant founder of LinkedIn, who's, um, recent book in a few years, just a couple back called Blitz Scaling, and how do you actually manage scale so that if you have an idea that can scale, you can quickly move, so. Uh, another question from uh, an alum, Kobe Ma, who's a fellow of the center actually, it's good to see Kobe on here. Um, he quotes Steve Jobs talking about the idea that that they needed to let go at Apple, the notion that for them, for Apple to win, Microsoft had to lose. Um, his question is really about, do we think the same mentality needs to be said on a geopolitical perspective between the US and China, so that the US need not lose so that China can win? It's not a zero sum game. Um, what are your thoughts on that regarding kind of the moving that statement from, from jobs many years ago to the international well, first level? Kobe, I, I, I'm hoping you're old enough to remember when Steve was trying to bring back Apple and he announced to all his, what I, you know, Steve was an evangelist first, believe it or not, I, I, more than a marketer or an innovator. He was, he was somebody you would follow if you heard him speak, you know, and kind of thing. So he was having a press conference and it was about taking an investment from Bill Gates and Microsoft. And the boos that came out were so loud from his audience, you know, who were just Apple devotees, uh, you know, and part of the cult, you know. So, and, it, and he had Bill Gates on the other screen and, you know, and even Bill was saying this is gonna be good and everything. I think we need more of that. I think Steve was absolutely right, you know. I think it shouldn't be about winning and losing, but how do you change behavior? I mean, we need a psychologist or a psychiatrist on this, um, you know, Patrick, because America and China, it does seem like a zero sum game. Who's win, who loses? Who's number one, who's number two? America, who wins the Super Bowl? You don't remember who lost the Super Bowl four years ago. You only remember who won the Super Bowl, you know, so. It's unless it was your home team, but you know, but it, it's that kind of mentality. And at least the first four phases of waves of computing, science was shared around the world, including in China with China. So I think it's got to start with that kind of open innovation and science sharing of science that I talked about. I mean, we have a perfect opportunity. It's way out of my category. But with this pandemic, I mean, shouldn't we be sharing all the science we possibly can, you know, to find a vaccine or, a, you know, a, a valuable cure? I mean, so the, you know, and I, and I throw that back to places like you, Tuck and Dartmouth and, and these great places of learning. How do you instill in the next generation of, of scholars and, and executives, you know, a not just all invented here mentality that they're is an ability to share and innovate and, and, and create co-science, you know, that, that works. So sorry to be bordering on moralistic there, but uh, I, it's, it's sort of a moral question in a lot of ways, you know. Larry, um, how does the, this ties us a little bit, how does the difference in data use and data privacy between the US and China impact these trends in innovation going forward, especially around much of the innovation driven going forward is going to, it's going to be based on information use and information access. Yeah, 
Uh, great question, Alva. And uh, again, uh, I think obviously data is power now. And I mean, the, the, the one company that shows data is power, at least to me the most, is, uh, is Facebook, uh, which, uh, and, and Amazon might be a close second to that. But then you look at Google, who's able to sort of be a little more secretive about their power of data, but they see every search in, you know, in real time. And that's pretty powerful data too. So I think the US, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but I think in the US, we have total access to, I think, more proprietary data than the Chinese do. And I think that makes the Chinese nervous. Um, and that and I think that brings out actually the worst in them is how do we get access to more of that kind of data? Do we buy more companies? Do we, you know, uh, can we get that kind of data through telecommunications connectivity? I don't think so. I don't, maybe you can suck it out as long as it's going along the wire or from the satellite. I, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know about that. But I do believe to what I first said that data is power. It's going to be the traffic cop of what innovation does. But how do you get a system where some data is shared without being feared? And how do you get a system where you do protect some data for country reasons or nationalistic reasons or, um, or um, you know, other, other specific reasons? I, I will tell you this, and again, it's way out of my category, but I think the reason that we don't, the United States doesn't get upset that much about if we know Elva likes Ralph Lauren shirts, you know, and, uh, and we make sure that you get an offer now and then, Alva, that you get, you know, $10 off your next Ralph Lauren shirt, you know, and we've come to accept that and that's okay. I think where it's going to start to get tough is the sharing of healthcare data. And I think that's where uh, even people in the United States who are thinking more liberally about the use of data and, and leveraging the use of data are going to go, wait a minute, now, you know, what's going on? And second to that is we have a company up here that claims to be having big leaps and bounds for the um, vaccine. I'm in Boston, by the way, people. So, uh, but Cambridge called Moderna, uh, M-O-D-E-R-N-A, and it said its first clinical trial is going very well for a COVID-19 vaccine, but it hasn't shared any data yet. It hasn't shared any science yet. So it's being very proprietary and close to the chest. You know, this is something that I think governments, the downside of creating nationalism is, is, is going to be allowing that restrictive use of data, uh, not for the betterment of humankind. So again, not to insert a lot of ethical or moral um, imperatives in this, but, you know, St. Ignatius was right. I mean, it's going to have to, you know, somehow we're going to have to get new rules to create more of a sharing of, 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 of ideas and thinking. So there's um, some questions related to this topic. So regarding whether or not, um, differences of opinion on free speech protections in China actually hamper some of their innovators and scientists. Um, and then a, a kind of a part two from, from, from the same, same alumni, alumna, alumnus is the degree to which US companies entering China being asked to change their way of doing things to align to the Chinese kind of preferences around data sharing. So you know, the flashpoint in the last couple of years being Google having a much different search engine built for China than it uses globally. Yeah, well, on the latter part, you know, that's the same, not just for Google, but that's France as, for example, Facebook to have sort of different types of privacy filters, you know, that, so I think that's common even not in China, but I think in the, in the bigger answer to your question, um, there seems to be on the positive side of China being less protective and less uh, onerous uh, about their innovation. It's only the last 10 years we've seen the rock star phenomena of the founding CEOs 
of Chinese companies as successful. That wasn't really allowed before. You know, we had we've always allowed that, right? It was even before the Bill Gateses and the Elon Musks, we had very famous, you know, executives that, you know, Lee Iacocca. I mean, it goes like you that was just came with the job, right? To be a famous personality. And now we have, you know, we have Pony Ma, we have uh, Jack Ma, I guess they're all related, but uh, that's a joke. But, you know, the, um, but, you know, so that's been allowed and I think that's a good sign, but um, I do think they do have an approach in the, in the lab or at R&D that underneath those entrepreneurs, no one owns an innovation. In other words, it's all the team and it's the team that does it where when we introduced Notes for Lotus, example, 1989, it was Ray Ozzie, the developer, that became very famous. But everybody else was fine with that because they, you know, they got their credit and credit was due for certain ingredients of the technology of, of the software. But that's not the same in Chinese development. So, I, th I think it's also interesting to think about in the context of data accessibility. You know, my my kind of experience with China is that in particularly in the development of AI systems, right, data matters a whole lot when it comes to training data, when it comes to, to other forms of data to be able to enable those systems to grow and learn. And that accessibility actually, and the lack of kind of significant walling off of privacy and the government plays an, an actual heavy handed role in, a good, you know, in support of companies, enables their systems to accelerate at a faster rate. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we've noted over the last few years is just the acceleration of China's growth in the AI machine learning space due to the accessibility of scale of data and, and availability of data and fusing together of data um, from different companies into, as you said, from you know, two different companies together to, to have a mutual benef beneficial uh, use of that data. Well, when the, you know, the machine learning is only as good as the information that was originally or the data that was originally assembled. So, you know, you, you have to see if how, how that went and that going. The other thing is, is this is where I bring up another leverage point for the United States. We are the ones that developed AI first. And this goes back almost 37 years ago with Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, you know, who started the MIT AI lab. Uh, back then we called them expert systems, you know, and it was the idea of that machine learning that eventually was going to create, the, you know, live forever, perfect robot, you know, the Frankenstein moment, I think. But, uh, you know, but we should rely as a, as, a, as a society, an American science society built on great engineering all the way back to Ben Franklin. We should look at that history and look at it with pride and look at how we led in AI, we have to keep leading in AI. You can you know, and we should we should fight to maintain that kind of lead instead of just, Here's some great technology by, you know. Yeah. So. Um, so if we think about that, there's a question from a, a current student about collaboration between the US and China on innovation. Yeah. And the question is around whether the US needs to partner with China more than the Chinese need to partner with the US or vice versa. So which do you think has more to gain and more to lose in a partnership? Um, or who's in most need of partnership at this point? Um, I would have to say I think the Chinese are in more need of partnership right now, uh, but they won't admit it. Uh, you know, they're stubborn like we are, and they're going to go their own way uh, if they have to, especially Huawei, um, you know, and Mr. Ren, but um, who's actually a very thoughtful man. Uh, but um, I, I think that um, uh, I think you have to remember that before this the last year or two of all the issues we've had uh, that um, I'll use Huawei as an example because I know it the best. I mean, you know, Microsoft was one of Huawei's biggest partners. So was Google, well, huge partner, you know, and um, so was Qualcomm, huge partner, billions of dollars, you know, and so not, continuing to build those kinds of partnerships with the Chinese are gonna hurt the American government. It's gonna hurt the American people because of the economy and it will hurt our innovation. So mm. I think we need it. 
they probably need it a little more than we do. It's, it's interesting. There was news thinking about that relationship as currently being dominated by the two sides of that, that debate between China and the U.S. Uh, so the vice chairman of Samsung this week was in China visiting uh, with shipmakers in China to, to think about filling some of that void coming out of Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, with, with Samsung products and services. And do you see this as an opening for a lot of other companies or companies in other countries that can fill, especially with the current kind of restrictions on semiconductors and, and other kind of hardware components being filled by companies from like Samsung and Korea and other places as well? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to change the, uh, the integrated circuit um, electronics landscape just by its nature that it takes so long to design a specific chip application and embed the software and then build it in a fab, blah, 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 blah. I think though that certain other countries like India have a chance if they can pick up on the innovation of quick manufacturing, of somehow understanding a piece of the technology in the chip infrastructure, whether that be better zoom technology or what, whatever it is, that can be created faster and easier. I mean, the cost of sensors now is pretty, pretty low, you know? So um, I would think there is some opportunity there, but the margins are shrinking and the other people are getting bigger like Samsung and uh, Qualcomm and obviously MediaTek in Taiwan. Uh, and then, you know, the Chinese chip makers are actually far more verticalized. So video, you know, software development, specific mm -hmm. applications, touch screen, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So another uh, question from one of our current students around TikTok accelerating the movement of its headquarters to Singapore. Um, do you think this, essentially, do you think this kind of current environment is going to result in some Chinese tech companies trying to kind of uh, accelerate their diversification or move away from, or decouple, I guess, from China? Um, in some way, shape, or form. Do you see that happening? Uh, sure. I think, I mean, in a way, I see Huawei. I mean, their sales of 140, 50 billion. I mean, I think they crossed almost 50% is now Western, you know, and Africa, you know. So even though they're a, quote, Chinese company, you know. You know, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, that we don't call our companies American companies. We just say, General Electric or, you know, Apple, but then we say, oh, Huawei, the Chinese company. So um, anyway, I think they're fighting to that answer the student's question. I think the big Chinese success stories are actually fighting and spending money on marketing too, to try to be more known as a global company. And they would like to be known as a global company that has solutions for more than just the Chinese marketplace. And some of them, really do. My guess is the Alibaba technology on e-commerce could be very useful, but I think Amazon has a reason not to share or not, not to want to partner, you know, with that. So there's a lot of reasons for that, but, um, you know, I don't see a mass move of, of big successful Chinese companies to places like Singapore. No, I don't see that happening, but, um, uh, so there's, there's been, you know, when I talk to folks on the West Coast and particularly in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, in Seattle, um, one of the, the sentiments around the increasing focus on competition and a little bit of walling off in some ways of, your, of American technology companies is the result of, you know, the large companies, right? The Amazons, Microsoft, Facebook, Googles of the world have sort of run out of room in their own lane that they've dominated mm -hmm. and are having to move into each other's space. And so... You know, do you think that plays a role here as well as fueling this kind of closing off of, of partnerships and, and other things regarding kind of technology in the U.S. and the competitive environment that, that it's been created as they look to invade each other's space for lack of a better, lack of a better term? Yeah, uh, I think it does because, uh, again, like I tried to show in my presentation, there's a period before the pre-competitive point of sharing innovation and technology development and finding that line 
where, oh God, I got to go get a product out fast, you know, is, is a tough call. But, um, you know, I, you're right to observe that, uh, especially Amazon, Apple, I mean, who would have thought they'd be competing with Disney, you know, or, uh, you know, Paramount Pictures or, you know, I mean, yeah. who would have thought that 20 years ago, you know, and, um, and so, um, sure. But, you know, I, I would throw that back, not for today, but I think that's a good business school topic because when you leave the thing that made you the greatest and you don't necessarily have the expertise completely, you know, can you completely succeed without partners? I don't know. The only thing I do know is that they are impacting the economy by shaping it a different way. And all those companies you mentioned are making content become more of a subscription service. And we're going to have less free entertainment. Uh, and what will happen is we'll get stupid things like TikTok, even though I think it's funny and interesting. It hasn't developed an I have to have kind of technology. All right. Well, and you don't have to have Facebook, I guess, either. So, but there are certain technologies like, uh, you know, virtual reality that they're developing and things that, that are probably going to be key to some of the things we accomplish in the way we live. So it's definitely an interesting time because, hmm. uh, you know, we're, but we're also living in a time where for the first time, technology companies can't just put a platform out and go, okay, if you do something bad with it, not my problem. Yeah. You know, it, it, you can't get away with that anymore. You, you know, so whether that be bad content or, you know, again, letting non-truths uh, mm -hmm. conspire, things like that. So it's a, totally interesting. So switching gears a little bit, um, there's quite a few questions around kind of national security questions um, and, and sort of how can, one particular question asks, how can Chinese tech firms address U.S. national security concerns in order to regain trust in, from consumers in the space and from the financial markets as well? Um, you know, how do you think that that plays into the Huawei debate as well? You know, that's been a large part of the, the res well, reluctance from the U.S. point of view. Well, well full disclosure, because I do advise Huawei, and that doesn't mean I believe that they're perfect and have everything they do. I would, I would drop them if they were, you know, found guilty of some kind of espionage, you know, and, and that would be terrible. But they have offered that example, and so has, uh, you know, a lot of the other companies, to complete open, open back doors to you. Our, our engineers can study it, look at it. The British and the Germans have studied the technology and, and have said it meets certain levels of security. And so I think that's one way to start building trust is that sort of, you know, being open with the code and, and showing the develop the developments and, and, and where the innovations are. The other thing I would say is espionage has been around, I think since Caesar's time. So um, I think uh, all governments, including ours are you know, trying to get one up on information. So uh, I'm not even going to touch that one. But what I am going to say is there is a moral way to use technology and data. And I just hope um, companies will, will maintain that and not let governments um, color that too much. Hmm. So uh, another question from a current student. Um, do you think that, you know, what are your, th if the questions around your thoughts on the impact of the initial phase of U.S.-China, the U.S.-China trade deal signed earlier this year? Um, including the the commitment to protecting intellectual property rights and and additional manufacturing purchases over the next couple of years. That's submitted by one of our T twenty ones. Who is actually a fellow with the center. So thank you for submitting questions, Jocelyn. Yeah. Well, it's a good question too. I mean, you know, the, the the devil's in always the details there, right? I mean, yeah. will people will they follow those? You know, new sort of incentives, those new rules, um, and, and stick with the agreement, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I can't call that. I hope they will uh, do that. But again, I think there needs to be a level of open sharing 
of IP to a certain point that is uh, critical to the future of innovation in, in a number of categories. So um, I, would, um, I would think that the trade agreement um, it could be good for us but, and, 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 and fair for us, but it, it still is hurting things like farmers very much and, um, and a lot of different. I mean, what we tried to do was, it was an integrated global economy, no matter what anybody said. And when you try to break that, that's there's going to be a lot of spilled milk. So um, we'll uh, we'll see. Again, not an expert on that stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's a professor oh. up there. No, is that so? Hey. so. <laughs> Just so, if you had your crystal ball, Larry, what what are you most confident about predicting about U.S. And technology, U.S. and China sort of technology trajectory going forward, innovation trajectory going forward. If if you had to place your bets on one or two things, what would you bet on? I would bet on China winning the infrastructure, the global infrastructure, uh, technology, and innovation category. And by that, I mean connectivity things, telecommunications things, uh, even partial chip things. But um, that's the one infrastructure I think the U.S. will maintain some intellectual lead on would be in the integrated circuit electronic space. I think we will continue to lead for decades in the software space, for sure, um, especially as we start automating things like uh, everything from finance to HR to uh, marketing. I mean, all those messages you get on Facebook now are automated based on data. You know, there's no person involved uh, kind of thing. So I also think the United States will be great on content and a little less on delivery. So I think we'll see more TikToks as delivery kinds of things. But you, uh, you'll see most content coming through uh, Google, Facebook, um, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, Disney, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. And I do think the U.S. has the real chance to be the, as technology marries medicine, I think it has a real leg up on, on most other economies, uh, including China, on the, the combining or the integrating of sciences like biology and computing. I think, uh, I think we have a real leg up there. And that's an area where I think, again, not to sound like Alvin Toffler or or anything, but it, it, you know, a uh, future shock. But I, I think that's where the U.S. is going to come up with things like the wearable MRI, like this company Open Water is developing in San Francisco, you know, and or you know, a replacement for the smartphone that is actually built in your wrist, you know, or or something like that. So I, you know, it sounds way weird, but I, I do, I do think the U.S. has uh, has a leg up on some of that stuff. We have a good question from a, a T70 writing in. It's relevant for us, especially here at Tuck. You know, with so many Chinese students studying in the U.S., do you think this helps bring the two countries together from a from a development perspective, from a technology innovation perspective? And you would think so. Um, you know, if if you know, you know, that's been one of the complaints of some of, it, especially the senators in the United States, that we educate uh, these people, they become fine. So engineers, and then they go back to China, or they you know go back to those markets. But um, that's only fair, you know, uh, f fair game, I think. But I do think uh, universities can play a huge role in, uh, in, in in sharing of science and, and and papers and innovation and technology. You know, and it didn't work at the time, but I remember when the Media Lab tried to open in Singapore, and it tried to open in Delhi. And, you know, it was sort of, it, it lasted for a couple of years, but then I, and I don't know, really know the reasons it didn't work, but I, I think there needs to be more of that partnership, more of that sharing, more of the studying, um, especially just from a commerce audience point of view. I mean, China and India, as their middle classes continue to rise, that's a lot of buying power. So, um, Talk 70, I heard that was a good class, so. 
I think we're just about out of time. I know we have a few questions we didn't quite get to and we're happy to follow up offline too with some of those folks. Don't hesitate to reach out to us, reach out to, to Larry here um, in the center. Uh, we'd be happy, we welcome these kinds of conversations. We'd be happy to schedule some additional things if, if that's of interest to this group as well. We apologize we didn't get through all the questions. Um, you know, on behalf of Tuck and the center, we wanna thank you, Larry. You know, it's always a pleasure to have you. This is your sort of second trip this spring virtually to our, for our students and alumni. And it's been great to have you back uh, here. I know you're a proud Dartmouth parent uh, of kids that went through the, the Dartmouth kind of world. So we, we claim you as one of ours. And, and, you know, Tuck Alumni Engagement has been a great partner for us to be able to bring these types of events to our alumni and our current student population. So, you know, thank you for, for all that knowledge that you've been sharing with us. Well, thank Larry, you. I can't wait till we're always going to be virtual now, but I can't wait to at least have a beer with you guys or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. Larry, you, 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 you've been present so much, we're going to start giving you the professor title. So we have to start calling you <laughs> Professor Weber. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> but thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to us in the center, to your, your folks in the alumni engagement team, Renee Hirschberg, and and their whole entire team is a great resource for you as well. Um, and really appreciate it. Hope everyone stays safe and healthy and we'll see you again soon.